All right. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. And welcome to today's Security Boulevard webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded. So if you missed any or all of today's event, you will have the opportunity to access it later. Following the webinar today, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for our speaker, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your question and answer interface on uh, the, the web interface here and uh, go ahead and submit your question and we will get to as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. We are also doing a drawing today for four $25 Amazon gift cards at the end of today's webinar, so please stick around. Hopefully, you'll be one of our four lucky winners. All right, with that, let's go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is finding security vulnerabilities before they find you. Our speaker today is Simon Maple and uh, with Sneak, and uh, Simon has an amazing presentation that includes pretty much an entire uh, a demo during the entire webinar. So I'm really super excited about this. Simon, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. I think we're going to have a lot of fun today. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the intro, Charlene. And uh, yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to do a lot of uh, some live hacking. And I say we because I'm asking everyone in the audience to also help me uh, by giving me suggestions about where I should hack and, and, and things like that. So we're going to have some fun. Um, yeah, I'd love to know who's in the audience. So please do go ahead and uh, say hello in the chat. Um, hello to everyone there from Vancouver. I'm from the UK. Hello from India as well. Nice to meet you all. Um, yeah, I'm from the UK. Right now, it's still very cold. It's still very rainy. We have a little bit of snow, but all is good. And today, we're going to be talking about security vulnerabilities. And I'm going to talk through a, a few slides. I promise not too many. Um, hello from Boston, one of my pretty much my favorite US city and Washington, of course. Um, and and yeah, we're going to do we're going to do some live hacking. And I promise not too many slides. So. Um, let's go straight in. First of all, who am I? My name's Simon Maple. Um, I'm, I'm very, very much into my community uh, uh, nurturing and community uh, engagements. I founded the Virtual Java User Group. I'm one of the co-leaders from uh, the London Java User Group. Uh, I'm also a co-leader of the Secure Developer Podcast, as well as the DevSecCon uh, community. Uh, I'm a Java champion for about five years or so, and there's some other awards which I've uh, very gracefully won uh, over the last 10 years or 15 years as well. Uh, my role is a head of developer relations here uh, at Sneak, and I've been here for about three years. At Sneak is a security company uh, that provides developer-first tooling to help developers find and fix vulnerabilities. So hello, from, hello to everyone. Look at all these wonderful places, Greece and Portugal. Oh my goodness, I'm so jealous at uh, what the temperatures must be there right now compared to here in the UK. So let's jump in. And first of all, I promise there's not going to be too many slides. I think there's maybe six, seven, eight or something like that. The first one is, is really uh, looking at how applications have changed over time. And realistically, pre-cloud, we looked as developers and practitioners to develop code in our IDE to pull in various open source libraries to support our, our application. We package that up, bundle it up, throw it over the wall, that, that, that famous wall that we used to separate developers and, and ops. And they used to deploy it on their platform, which consisted of a number of different things here, anything from hardware all the way up through uh, through virtualization, VMs, and, and, and applications that the IT teams uh, maintained as well. Our application scope was pretty small, and the developers focused on just the application code they wrote and the open source libraries that they pulled in. Used to be a much more straightforward role for, for a developer. But these days, when we think about the scope of what a developer touches and what a developer maintains, that can go down from still the application code and the open source libraries, but potentially that runs in a Docker container, potentially that runs on a mesh, potentially that runs within a, an orchestration platform. All of these contain um, either code or config or some kind of um, artifacts that a developer will need to touch, potentially construct, check into a source repo. The developer scope of the application has changed significantly because how we deploy and maintain uh, applications has changed. And when we think about it purely from a security point of view, 
each of these areas that a developer touches and, 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 uh, and maintains equally needs to be maintained from a security point of view. And when we think about some of these things, you know, whether it's cloud services, container services, uh, cloud, uh, cloud um, things like S3 buckets, we hear so many times about misconfigurations because a developer wants to get things working and potentially doesn't recognize where misconfigurations could be. So we need to make sure that when we create these things, when we script these uh, artifacts and, 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 and services that we require for our application to run, we think about it from a security point as well. So let's think about it from a developer's point of view and, and, and the risks that are involved in this typical style of cloud native application and how a developer can, can uh, realistically protect. We think about custom code. I'll talk about that in, 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 a, in a second, but first of all, I want to come to some of the other areas which are beneath the, the ID, away from where a developer tends to write their code and focus most. Open source code. So when we think about an application that a developer writes, they depend on a whole bunch of other libraries or frameworks, typically referencing through their POM XMLs or, or their Node JSON or their package JSONs, whatever, whatever it is. So much of the application is now uh, open source, looking at 80, 90%, sometimes much, much more. Uh, a lot of the vulnerabilities are going to come through the open source code. And in fact, the majority come through transitive dependencies. So dependencies which are direct dependencies themselves depend on. Um, this is a great uh, analogy that I heard that others in the company use, which I only heard yesterday. I'll tell you this now. Uh, I only heard it yesterday. It's about a house party. And you invite like five people. And then those five people actually invite another couple each. And then those couple may invite three, four each. And before you know it, you've got like 500 people in your house, right? This is how we construct applications in real life. We rely on several dependencies that then rely on several others. And we construct a dependency graph. This is where the open source code uh, is, is packaged into our application. After that, hell, absolutely, Jackie. This is a, this is dependency hell as well, right? Um, containers. When we think about containers, we wrap our application into a deployable artifact that you know sits in a container and can can run somewhere. Now, within our containers, there are a number of things that can contain vulnerabilities there as well, uh, including hundreds of. Linux packages, right? There's packages, there's other things, artifacts that we put in there, maybe node runtimes or JDK runtimes and things like that. Now, these are decisions that we as developers often make very, very quickly in terms of that direct that from directive. What are we inheriting? Are we actually pulling from the right base image, the right parent image? Uh, are we actually pulling in a platform that is so big it contains hundreds of packages we don't need that are potentially vulnerable? This is an area that we as developers love because we can spawn containers up very, very quickly and, and create runtimes very quickly, but we need to uh, be a little bit responsible here. And then the third thing, once we go beyond containers, is about how we actually code that up uh, in terms of uh, config, in terms of our defaults to whether it's Kubernetes config, whether it could be Terraform scripts. Uh, we need to make sure that these, all of these new development artifacts are written in a maintainable way, but also a secure way. And uh, like I say here, um, the number one cloud vulnerability is misconfiguration. And so insecure defaults is is one of the clear ways in which S3 buckets, as a overused example, but one of the most common ways in which uh, these kind of uh, infrastructures can be can be hacked, uh, are misconfigured and and as a result permissions uh, granted where they shouldn't be, etc. Um, when we look back to custom code, uh, we think about the code that we write in our ID and how we can protect that. Uh, this is obviously less known to uh, attackers because attackers, when they look at known vulnerabilities, they recognize a vulnerability that exists in a particular place could easily replicate across many, many spaces. And we'll take a look at that in just a second. But your custom code can equally um, contain vulnerabilities, perhaps input validation that's missing or something like that. We need to make sure that we spot those as we, as we go forward as well. So the DevOps world has made us deliver faster. It's made us being able, it, may, it makes us uh, able to push to production many times a day if we choose. And we need to make sure security fits into that model. We can't live in a, in a space anymore whereby, uh, you know, security runs every couple of years. And that's one of the things that DevSecOps is trying to do. It pulls security into DevOps, but it also pulls security teams into that space, whereby security teams are there to then support the development environment and the, and the engineering teams. And the engineering teams need to feel empowered to be able to not just find, but fix issues as they go. So DevSecOps is there as, a, as an amazing new 
well, not new, but amazing buzzword to help speed up um, uh, the, the delivery of software, but in a secure way by integrating security into that pipeline without it being a blocker or without it slowing you down as a developer um, to, to, to push code securely. There's a big lack of security focus, and one of the possible reasons for this is the is the siloed experience that we see within within organisations of uh, of security being you know one team and, and development organisations being another team, and the integration the uh, interactions occur rarely when a security team uh, provides an audit or something like that to a development team, and the the, the those are never good interactions. So, uh, allowing that security focus to happen earlier and making the security team a part of that engineering organisation uh, when we're delivering software. And of course, security data, uh, or should I say, uh, customer data could be compromised. And of course, we've all heard of the Equifax breach. I'm not going to talk too much about Equifax because it's a very overused example. But this is the Apache Struts attack timeline where you can see uh, when a, a vulnerability, uh, and in this case, this CV at the top that we reference, when a vulnerability is, is made available, um, a, an exploit can very, very quickly hit the exploit's DB. And as soon as that exploit, it's very, very easy, as I'll show you, to, to hack that kind of a, uh, an environment. And the number of attacks that occur, because Java Struts is a very commonly used library, the number of attacks that you can then make against uh, plenty of different pr uh, production environments is very, very significant. So um, when we think about your application, and this is the this is the, uh, the, the SCA piece, when we think about your application, it contains two pieces, the code you write. We need to make sure that's secure, but it also the application uh, that you deploy needs to needs to contain all those open source uh, uh, libraries. I'm going to give you a very quick example here. This is a serverless example, and this serverless example is 19 lines of code, and this 19 lines of code contains two direct dependencies, and those two direct dependencies include a further 17 dependencies. So we have now have 19 lines of code that are pulling in. 19 dependencies. So my question to everyone, please feel free to, to answer in the chat. My question to everyone is, when we think about the lines of code that we deploy, how many lines of code do you think we'll be deploying in this application? And the question there is really not just about the, the lines of code that we see in our IDE, but then the lines of code in the libraries. Now, this is an interesting one. So we have lots of people saying hello. Hello, John. Hello, Alwyn. Hello, Jane uh, from Texas, from Delaware. Lots of people from the US. Awesome. So we have 10x, a 10x of, uh, presumably that's a 10x on the 19 lines of code, 10 million, 100,000, 10 million is a lot of code. Um, it's actually very close to what Alok is, uh, has suggested there, which is 191,000 lines of code. So when we think about what we write, uh, we have to think about not just what we write in our IDE, but what we deploy, because we don't support what we write in our IDE, we support what we deploy. And we need to think more about what is available in production rather than what is available in 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 uh, in our IDE. Freezing Canada, Sergey. I hear you. I'm in the UK, so I totally hear that. Okay. So without any further ado, let's jump into some uh, some some hacks. So I promised you not too much not too much um, uh, slides, and I did about. 10 minutes or so, so that's that's pretty good. OK, uh, first thing I'm going to do is show you this application. Let me quickly sign up on this application. This is a Java application, which is uh, deployed on Heroku. So I'm going to quickly uh, sign in. And my name is Simon. I'm going to pass in my email. I'm going to use 123456 as my password. I'm very security conscious. Registration failed. Email, oh. Well, I thought it was going to be something about my password. It didn't like my email. There we go. OK, so I sign in. And here's my to-do list. And I can oops, I can create a to-do if I wish. And just to show you how this works, let me buy my wife some flowers. She definitely deserves it. Uh, let's add a date. Whoops. Uh, sometime in 1970. Let's make it. Make it romantic and do Valentine's Day. I better make that high because it's 1970. There we go. Nice to do. There we have uh, just how the application works. If I click on the about, 
we can see uh, some more information. Typically, this won't be on the about box, but you can see it from a number of different uh, styles of uh, 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 ways of gathering this kind of information. We can see that we're using struts to a vulnerable version, and this is the this is the actual uh, um, vulnerability. We're going to hack the vulnerability that. Equifax uh, um, first were hacked on, uh, which got which got the attacker in for the first time, and they were using uh, a, a version of Struts uh, which was similar to this, as it had the same vulnerability in it. So we know this application, which is running on this Heroku uh, space, is vulnerable. So we're going to try and hack that now. Let me show you uh, how I would do that if I was to go into Sneak and go into Java Goof Exploits. Make that a touch bigger so you can see that. OK, I'm going to show you something uh, briefly, which is this. And there we go. This is the this is the special incantation. I'll make that a touch bigger as well so you can see that. This is the special incantation that I need to send on my request to a vulnerable struts endpoint to actually uh, attack this. And let me take you through it a little bit. You'll see a content type as part of my request. That's an illegal content type because it contains the percent brace. That illegal content, in fact, it's got a closing brace here. Now, one of the things that we'll do as a result of this request is take you through an, elite, uh, uh, an exception path. And when we go through the exception path, there's a wonderful uh, library called OG GNL, which can uh, which can evaluate certain things, look at certain um, uh, variables and things like that, and gather richer information that it can send back and provide a user with a nicer, much much nicer exception uh, reason. So what? One of the things that OGNL does is it, in fact, evaluates strings that are between the percent break or, or surrounded with the brace and starting with a percent. Now, as a result, because we've done, because we've created this uh, in our uh, ex in our content type, as a result of trying to format this string, it's actually going to start executing this. It's going to evaluate everything between this percent and the brace. And as part of evaluating this, we are going to be running. Uh, in here, you can see the, the the pound P is going to be running a new process builder. And that Java process builder is going to run CMDS, which is going to kick off bash, and it's going to pass it a command, which we are just uh, using as a placeholder here for command. So if I were now to, um, uh, let's grab this, and just to save my typing, what we're going to do now is we're going to cap that file. So we're going to send that header as part of my request. We are going to substitute the command keyword for slash env. And we're going to send that as a curl request. Rather than do that to my local host, we're going to send that across to this Heroku instance. So I send that here uh, to my Heroku app location. And this is going to run env on this Heroku application. And this is, by the way, this is a something I haven't touched. This is out the box. This is all the same permissions, et cetera. Uh, and as soon as I run that, bang, there we go. There's our first exploit. We're getting the environment variables off that Heroku machine. And I can see a number of things from here, including uh, some JVM options, uh, including my working directory, where my Java home is, my path. Uh, and believe it or not, I'm sure no one on this call does, but believe it or not, people will put sensitive information in their environment variables, usernames, passwords, keys, API keys, all, all those kind of things. And this is you know, a great place for attackers to look and try and find more information that will, that will provide them with a new way in. Um, so that's our first hack. Now, I want to show you, um, I talked about, I talked about the the way an application has changed and the different methods of security which we need in order to uh, in order to look at our application in a different way. So as applications have turned more cloud native, uh, we and, and developers are touching different aspects of code, not just the code that they write in their IDE on their application, but also open source libraries, uh, container images, and infrastructure as code. We need a way to protect that. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna quickly uh, go ahead and import. Uh, I'm going to be using Sneak here, a uh, company I work for. Everything I show you is entirely free, um, but we're really going to be talking about uh, the, the the application uh, behind it that we're going to be scanning. So I'm going to go ahead and and, and import a project uh, into uh, from GitHub uh, into Sneak, and this is going to automatically. This is going to be a Kubernetes example. Uh, give Kubernetes. There we go. This is automatically going to pull it in and scan different areas uh, of that application, and that is going to include uh, the code that we write, the libraries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and in fact, here we have 
that application. Uh, and you can see tested a few seconds ago, uh, we have code analysis, we have a Docker file, we have some YAML files, some JSON, uh, package JSON, and we can see the vu different vulnerabilities that exist in these spaces. So if I was to click on code analysis, the code that I am therefore writing in my IDE, we'll be able to see a, a number of different exception, uh, sorry, a number of different vulnerabilities that that I need to deal with in my code. And we can take a look at some of these. So SQL injection is a, is a classic and very often uh, there because we don't, uh, we don't uh, validate and sanitize uh, input that is that is third party input that is that is given to us. So as a as, as an example here, uh, here we have a, a function which uh, which grabs an HTTP request, it flows in and we send to a database this user dot find, we're sending um, a username straight from this request body. So as a result, we're, we're taking exactly what the user gives us and just throwing that to our database. So if, for example, someone was trying to, uh, you know, add an escape in there and add something else in there as well, we might all of a sudden be sending back more information or updating uh, more than we expect. Uh, what we need to do is sanitize this request body username uh, input and make sure that we're not you know, we're not passing in dangerous characters into our database. So this is exactly what's happening as well uh, with command injection, and there's others there as well. So we need to make sure uh, at, at first step uh, what issues uh, exist uh, and also what we need to do uh, to, to, to be able to fix them. And this is obviously uh, where that issue exists in, in the application. So... SAST is an important piece. This is the ability to statically test and find vulnerabilities in our application. The next piece uh, that I want to kind of uh, take you through, if I come back to my Goof uh, application, is this package JSON. What this is, what this uh, sneak has found is that this is a an artifact that describes our dependency graph. Uh, as a result, this package JSON will contain direct direct dependencies. Uh, and if I click on here, you'll be able to see the dependency graph. So this will contain direct dependencies, such as ADM-zip at a specific version, uh, 047. That might contain a high sev vulnerability, like in this case. There are others uh, that, for example, body parser has a transitive dependency that has a high sev vulnerability. So from a, from a security point of view, we need to care about the graph that is created as well as where the vulnerabilities exist in that, in that graph. Now, let's start some hacking, shall we? Um, I'm going to pick a vulnerability. Uh, or, or a yeah, vulnerability called directory traversal. Now, directory traversal is the type of vulnerability that typically when an application provides um, provides access to a specific directory, an attacker might try and break out of that directory and try and find other pieces of data, which perhaps they shouldn't, you know, private data that they shouldn't have access to. So directory traversal is a vulnerability that allows a user or an attacker, should I say, to breach or break out of a, a, an allowed directory and access files they shouldn't. And this vulnerability is found in the ST module, which is a, a node uh, library that allows uh, serving of static data. It's introduced through version 024. Um, there is uh, an exploit available. It's a proof of concept. It is fixed in version 025. So the, the actual fix for this, but for these kind of vulnerabilities isn't like the previous one where we need to do some input validation and check our code to make sure that we, uh, we're, we're uh, do doing those kind of checks. But this is actually to change our dependency graph. And the way to change that dependency graph is if I click on this fix, fix this vulnerability uh, link here is actually to send, and I can do this because I connected into GitHub, to send a pull request uh, back across into my source code repository. And um, if I was to scroll down, you'll see this is the vulnerability I'm, I'm fixing. And by, by changing that dependency, by bumping it up to the minimum version possible, and in this case, that's a bump from 024 to 025, what we effectively do is pull in the fix to this vulnerability into our application because you know the maintainer fixed it in 025. That is now the version uh, that we are pulling it in. So from 024 to 025, it's as simple as that. We will, of course, need to run testing. And this can be uh, tougher if this jump is actually more significant. But I'm not going to merge that. Um, we have the application running here, for example. This is the goof to do application. And let me show you this application. And my question is going to be, so feel free to answer this whenever you would like. My question is going to be, how are we 
as a as an attacker, put your attacker hat on now. How are we going to try and break this application? We're going to try and exploit that vulnerability. And that's a real vulnerability in a real library that many people are using in production. And while you're thinking about that or while you're typing, I'll show you around this application a little bit. So it's called a goof to do application. It allows me to type in a, a number of to do. So I can buy milk. Uh, I can phone. Mo Oops, mom, mom. There we go. I can do. I can do a whole ton of stuff there. Um, I can also. Um, don't worry about the choose file or import. That's a different vulnerability. I know everyone typically jumps to that straight away. Um, I can. Oops. I can click on uh, about, and this takes me to uh, a uh, um, an about HTML. But how would you try and attack? this application to produce a directory traversal. Any thoughts? Feel free to just drop it into the chat. I'll give you a couple of hints if there's no uh, if there's no comments in chat. So we need to find reference an image tag. Ah, very interesting. So that's a that's a Okay, and Matthew's a very good suggestion as well. So referencing the image tag, so we can do that in here. There is a way, actually. So you may be even thinking of doing something along these lines, so an image tag being something like this, perhaps. Um, that's actually a really good suggestion, and that is another vulnerability. We can cover that one straight after this, if you'd like. Uh, the dot dot slashes from Matthew, and in fact, I'm going to combine that with Luca's suggestion about trying to work with URLs. So when we try and when something is being served to us, typically, in fact, if I go to the about HTML page, you'll see that this is actually being served from a URL, and that URL is the public uh, directory. So let me. Um, do, 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 do. Let me go into, actually, I think I might even have, yes, I do. Uh, let me curl. You'll see, let me do that on a fresh screen so you'll see that at the top. You'll see, see my HTML page. Um, it looks just as pretty in a, in a, in a uh, terminal as it does a browser. Um, what I'm going to do here is the dot dot slashes right so this is what matthew was suggesting that we do with the url so let's just do a single dot dot slash there this should work right this is going to break us out of the public directory and breaking out out breaking us you know put, putting us in somewhere where we shouldn't have access to so if i was to run that let's see what we do have we broken it straight away we have not in fact you can see Phone mom is there, buy milk is there. This is actually the home page. And this is the home page because um, the ST library is a real world library. And the ST library is trying to understand when users or attackers are trying to do something malicious. And this dot dot slash is a malicious attack, is, is a malicious way of breaking out of the directory, right? So my question is we are we are really close and we're on the right lines. My next question. How can we how can we change our request here so that it's still doing something very very similar, but it's not using the dot dot slash? So the st library is recognizing that those characters. It's recognizing the dots, and it doesn't like that. So Chris Johnson, yes. Uh, in fact, there's a couple of questions. There's a couple of options there. So Bill Mitchell says escape the dot. Uh, Chris Johnson says encode the dot. So the escaping the dot is not going to really going to help too much because escaping a dot, uh, what the escaping does is typically if there's if if you know we're in a string and it needs to recognize actually this isn't a special character this is a this is actually a dot or this is actually a slash or actually a double uh, quote then that's what we need to do to escape but it's recognizing the dot for what it is chris has got it right there with the url encoding uh, anyone recognize anyone remember what the url encoding is of a dot i'll save you the effort it's percent to e percent to e so a percent to e is a url encoded dot okay now if i was to send this Oh, look, we have something now. There we go. We have broken out of the public directory because I see the public directory there. Um, and that public directory is um, where we should be. We can now see whole parts of the app or even potentially the system. Um, think about what you would do now as an attacker. You're the attacker now. What would you do if you 
found a system like this, obviously very ethically hacking for uh, to, to provide that information back. But what would you what would you do if you were an attacker? What would you try and learn about the environment? What would you try and gain uh, from this situation as an attacker? Any thoughts there? And by the way, while you're while you're typing that in, David Kramer says, "Yeah, reference one of the JS files to see the source code." That's an excellent idea. One of the things that I'll very quickly show you as well is something very interesting. The whereby, if I was to try that same thing at the browser and do percent to e percent to e, you actually go back to the home page as well. And the reason is um, because when I'm at a terminal and I do a percent to e percent to e, there's no normalization that happens. Whereas when I'm, in a, when I'm in a browser, the browser will normalize that back to a dot, and then send a dot back to the back to the server. So I'm actually sending raw data here from from curl. So let's see what we have. Um, so etc shadow from Connor, excellent. David wants to see some JavaScript files. Let's have a look at some JavaScript first. Uh, so what do we have? db.js maybe. Whoops, not J A J S. There we go. We can see source code straight away. We can see us. We can see a hard coded password. Wonderful, super secret password as well. Uh, we can get to the etc shadow. So uh, let's go all the way back and etc. Maybe maybe let's do the etc password. Uh, and there we go. Not as useful as the shadow these days, but yeah, this is uh, this is the the cliche file that we wanna we wanna grab. Um, System from yeah, get the system info from files, uh, user passwords, uh, and, and all that. You can now scroll. You can now traverse the entire system based on the permissions that you have. And in this case, this in fact, uh, I'll show you exactly which user I, I am. Uh, if I look at the Docker file, uh, you'll see there is no user. Um, as a result. I am running as root, so now I have root privileges on this machine, read only because I'm I'm just curling and just trying to ser get information that's being served right now. Um, I can also see I'm running Node Slim. Um, there's a whole bunch of information that you can kind of like uh, you can, you can grab this. Um, okay, uh, let's jump into something else now. Where we, um, where am I? I want to go here. So uh, let's go back. A uh, quick question in from David Kramer about Apache. Yes, Apache does protect against this. There's a number of things that will uh, protect against this. You can either be defensive in your coding. You can use uh, the right um, uh, libraries that actually protect against it themselves as well. And then Apache servers and other things like that can uh, also protect against that. But you have, to, you have to be able to use it correctly. You have to be able to configure it correctly. And it's very often the, the misconfigurations that put us in uh, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these issues. So, using a lot of the right uh, gates and guards will protect us against uh, a lot of this if they're used and if they're used correctly as well. So, yeah, there is no one solution. There are several solutions, and we shouldn't rely on just one uh, to fix this for sure. Um, so, let me go back to projects, and I'm going to jump back into this project. And in this file, in this uh, Docker file, uh, we can see a number of things. So, um, Docker files are used much, much more these days. Uh, I think. Uh, Gartner was saying by 2022, 75% of organizations are going to be using Kubernetes, are going to be using uh, uh, containers in production, which is which is pretty astounding. Um, we can see from here, what people will tend to do is look for which image they usually use or potentially what um, uh, what other images that they find uh, are using and, and replicate that. There's a, it's, it's not necessarily a, a good uh, formal process that many follow to, to pick the right uh, base image. And what that leads to is uh, us potentially not running on uh, maybe one of the more recent base images and potentially not the right base image. So for example, here we're running on a specific base image, which is node eight. Um, there could be potentially major upgrades or maybe some minor upgrades, depending on which uh, base image we're using, um, which can eliminate many more vulnerabilities than, than than we currently have. And you can see here, while the while the total number of vulnerabilities hasn't changed too, too much, the severity wise, we've gone from 192 down to 56. So this gives really interesting information about how we can upgrade our images to eliminate vulnerabilities in our, in our base packages. Now, one of the other things that we need to really seriously think about is alternative images. So a lot of people you know, tend to use like a, a node A or something like that. Um, we need to also think about these slim tags whereby um, 
we are provided with a with an operating system here, which is much much uh, reduced in size and 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 um, and footprint. That eliminates number of vulnerabilities largely because we're actually not shipping as many uh, packages, and and a lot of applications can easily run on these because the applications aren't even using those uh, packages in the system. So it's well worth looking at which potential uh, alternatives you could be using that can very very quickly eliminate the number of vulnerabilities that you're that you're you know dropping into your production environments um, just by reducing the footprint that you have and making sure you're you're fairly uh, fairly up to date um exactly the same style that we have here with our applications as well so you, you'll see your packages have large dependency trees you'll see a number of issues that can exist in your um in your uh, packages or your operating systems, uh, as well as other things that exist perhaps in, in, in some of the binaries that you use. So maybe some vulnerabilities in node or other things that you, that you drop into that environment. So your container is, is something which is very, very important to, uh, to manage as well. Let me show you a, a vulnerability that exists in a container that I have. Um, and in fact, let me show you the, um, application first. Uh, I have run Docker here. This is, there it is. That's the application that I'm going to be running. So let's drag it onto this window so you can all see it. Okay, there we go. And uh, this allows me to choose uh, an image that I want to convert to Twitter and make it my make it my profile picture. So let's, I know I was actually talking about these, uh, these oops, about these, uh, these dogs and stuff on uh, on this webinar just before we went live. So let's grab a screenshot of this little dog, um, and I'm going to choose that file. If I upload uh, that file, where is it? This one. I'm going to upload that, and I'm going to click resize, and it provides me with a much much smaller image uh, in terms of resolution that I can then upload into my uh, into my Twitter profile. Now, what we're going to do. Um, is we, this is using uh, a, a package called Image Magic behind the scenes. Many of you will have heard of Image Magic. I think it actually just had another recent uh, vulnerability against it. But Image Magic suffers from uh, one of the things it suffers from is, a, is, is code injection vulnerabilities. And I'll show you uh, an example file which can potentially have uh, those kind of vulnerabilities. So if I go into uh, Sneak and I go into my container breaking in, my exploits, I'm going to pick RCE1, remote code execution 1.jpg. Open that. And before I click resize, I want to actually show you that uh, file. So um, where am I? Let's try this one. OK, I'm going to cat. Let's uh, make it a touch bigger. Cat RCE1.jpg. And what you'll see there is on this fill line, this third line, um, we pass in a URL and we escape uh, the URL. Once we've you know, tried to populate it with something, we've, we've escaped it. Uh, we've created an, uh, an OR function and we've just executed touch and then passing RCE1. So we are trying to um, do something a little bit naughty here by escaping out of a uh, um, something that is going to potentially execute a, a download or something like that. We're escaping out of it. We're trying to run something and then we'll drop back in afterwards. So um, that's all we're doing. And if I was to actually, first of all, uh, go in and show you this, um, here we go. If I was to show you where we are on this Docker host, this is my, this is an SSH into this Docker environment. You'll see there is currently no, um, RCE1 file there. But if I was to now click resize and take a look there now, there we have RCE1, which was just added there, February 10th. Um, so what we've then there just done is just by passing in a, a file that performs uh, uh, a, a code injection which breaks out and, and then and then runs on that environment, uh, an, a remote code execution on that container. 
and this is all because of image uh, vulnerability in image magic um which is a package that we pull in as a result of using that container this is actually a vulnerability which has a very aptly named uh to, ap aptly named to it which is image tragic which is uh, I, I find quite amusing in my in my geeky way but with image tragic it allows us to go one step further uh with image tragic let's let's go back and uh create another uh image there this is going to be rce2 and what we're going to do now is we're going to use remote code execution to create this reverse proxy uh to back into our container this is a this is a really fun one let me let me jump out back into here and this time around i'm going to cat rce jpeg. Now here we're going to do something very similar on the image over this time. Um, we're going to be grabbing something here, but you see this little back tick. This little back tick means uh, evaluate things within that. And we're going to be evaluating this line here. And we're going to be doing a W get, uh, and we're going to pull uh, a file from uh, this certain location, which is r.sh, that is the file. This is going to actually pipe down to a, uh, a serving uh, um, a, a serving uh, process on my machine in a second, and it's going to pull down the contents of r.sh, and it's going to it's going to pipe that into a file called r.sh, and it's going to execute that. So let's cat r.sh, and this is our script that we're now going to run on this Docker instance. Uh, we are going to do another w get, but this time we're going to pull down netcat, and netcat is also going to be hosted from my laptop. Um, and it's going to pull that down. It's going to extract it. It's going to go in. It's going to build it. And then we're going to actually run netcat. And we're going to try and connect to uh, 3031. OK, so a couple of things we need to do, first of all. First of all, I'm going to need to, if I ls minus l in here, you will see we have netcat here and we have the r.sh. So the first thing I'm going to do is serve those files and we are now serving from my local host port 5000. Uh, so this is this is a nice little way of me being able to just share the r.sh and, and, and netcat uh, files across. The next thing I want to do is create here uh, a little netcat listener running on port 3031. So now, if anything wants to connect to this, I can kind of like do a nice little uh, reverse proxy into that environment. All I need to do now is come back over to my machine here and click resize. Now this goes away. What it's going to do, just to remind you, it's going to perform a W get from my laptop of uh, the r.sh file. It's going to execute that locally on its uh, on its uh, Docker instance. It's going to grab netcat. It's going to extract it and it's going to connect now to this listener, which is running on port thirty thirty one. So now, in theory, if I was to type ls there we go. That's actually connected in now to my Docker instance. And now I have this very, very effectively nice uh, terminal into my instance. Now I can kind of like just run things. So I can PS minus EF perhaps, and I can see the processes running and I can do a whole, a whole ton of things um, uh, in, in there as well. So that's a really nice example about how you can kind of like exploit your, your packages in your, in your Docker container as well. Okay. Uh, I've got a few minutes left before I want to uh, hand over to, for some questions. But what I also wanted to show you was how we then go and complete that story, whereby we don't just talk about your code that you write in your IDE, code that you pull in from your uh, third party libraries and your container, but also the IAC uh, as well. And if I look at your infrastructure, look at the infrastructure as code here, and let's, why don't we grab one of these goof mongo, goof. Mongo, um, and take a look at here. Potentially um, defaults here that we have written down or haven't written down uh, in these in these kind of config files in these YAML files. It's very very easy without knowing what to do to introduce vulnerabilities through here. So what we do is effectively a, a, a SAS style scan of these files, whereby we identify where vulnerabilities can exist through through a number of rules, um, and we tell you in each of these um, per line uh, what the vulnerability is, what the severity of that vulnerability is. Um, what it means, the app armor profile is not set correctly. What this means in terms of 
uh, an issue to you as a user. So, okay, we're not enforcing mandatory access control and how you can resolve it. And this is the important piece, right? Everything I've shown you is not just about showing you an issue. It's about what is the, what is the, uh, what is the fix to that issue? How do I get around it? And this is this is how we empower developers. It's about what do I need to add into this file to to actually fix this issue. And and, and another good example here is a container running uh, without a root control user. What the impact is and how you resolve it and so forth. So this is this is really really key. And of course, this can run across your Kubernetes config, across your your Terraform scripts, etc. Um, but again. These are this is this is the kind of the new life that developers live in, whereby it's not just about the the the, the source code; it's about everything from your infrastructure across to your source code, uh, and this is this is what provides us uh, with that coverage. Okay, um, happy to take questions. Um, I'm going to pass over just briefly for the uh, for for the for the draw on the Q and A. Um, if we don't have too many questions, of course, I'll be happy to stay on and perform some more hacks. We'll never run out of time. Um, but uh, yeah, with that, I'll, I'll pass over to Charlene. Yeah, great, great, great. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. want to make sure. Okay, perfect. Excellent, because you never know with these microphones these days. <laughs> if, you have, if you have a question for Simon, please go ahead and use the question and answer tab and submit it, or you can use the chat tab as well. That's fine. Either works. Uh, and while we are waiting for a couple to come in, uh, just I just want to quickly remind the audience that today's event is being recorded. So if you miss any or all of it, just want to see what uh, magic Simon is doing in today's webinar. If you want to watch it again, you'll have the opportunity opportunity to do so. Um, so uh, Chris Johnson, uh, thank you for that for your question. The question is, do the sneak checks work on just Java or other languages uh, too, such as PHP? Yeah, no, we, we, we work on a whole ton of languages, um, Java, uh, uh, JavaScript, PHP, uh, a number of other JVM languages, Golang, Go modules, um, Python, a whole ton of different languages. So yeah, we're actually doing C, C++ uh, as well uh, coming out. So yeah, a whole ton. Feel free to feel free to to check it out on the website at sneak.io, and you can you can um, you can give it a go against your repository. In some places, you might need to run it on the CLI versus the uh, the import, like I showed you. Um, but uh, but yeah, we will be able to uh, we'll be able to do that as well. Awesome, awesome. Okay, Chris. Chris is full of questions. He's got another one for you. Can the sneak tool be run locally for those projects that are not on GitHub? Yes, absolutely. Uh, for for um, when you're looking at running sneak against a source code repository, you can obviously do a whole ton of stuff. Like, for example, um, uh, uh, GitHub checks. So, if I uh, just to show you why it's it's useful, uh, if I was to go to GitHub. Uh, Simon Goof. There's a couple of things like uh, the pull requests that I sh that I just created, for example. Um, let's let's take a look at this one, for example. Any pull request which is created um, is is uh, uh, created. Is, sorry, is tested for your licenses and your your also if there are any new vulnerabilities that are occurring because of that pull request. So when I pulled uh, the project from GitHub, I was importing it and sneak. Uh, monitor starts monitoring that project, so it doesn't just pull it from GitHub. It also starts doing a whole ton of stuff within GitHub as well. If there are new vulnerabilities that affected um, uh, your project, uh, or sorry, that didn't affect your project at the time of scanning, but does in a day or two, Sneak constantly monitors each of these projects that you import. So it does a ton of that in the background as well, which is why it is useful to to to, to perform that step. But if you wanted to run it more in uh, a, so where am I? Let's jump to uh, one of these. If you wanted to run it um, at the command line as well, I can just run sneak test there. Um, and that will, yeah, that, that's effectively just testing it against my uh, package JSON locally, reaching out to the vulnerability database um, on sneak and, and effectively, effectively gonna give me exactly the same results uh, through there. You can also run it against, um, uh, uh, on-prem source code managers. So, you know, your GitHub Enterprises, your, your uh, uh, what are the others, like Bitbucket uh, server um, and other things like that. You can also run the whole thing on-prem uh, as well if you, if you prefer. 
Nifty. All right, great. Uh, here's another question for you uh, from Peter. Are the IAC checks, infrastructures, code checks included in the free version of Sneak? Uh, yes, uh, in, in, in terms of the free version of Sneak, uh, there are a number of features that you won't necessarily get, which are more of the enterprise features. Uh, but for, uh, across the board, you'll get um, free tests every single month. So it's not a trial. It's a, it's a, it's a free plan, which you can use Sneak uh, with a limited number of tests every single month. All right, perfect. All right. And it looks like we're starting to get groundswell on David's mm. uh, question, which is, it looks like Sneak is cloud uh, SaaS, which mm. you have to submit your internal code to. Mm. How do we know that this is safe? Is is there a statement on the website guaranteeing the code isn't saved slash shared, i.e. <laughs> Sneak isn't a security yeah. <laughs> That's a good question. No. It's an That's excellent question. One. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and you know, you know, we sell to a lot of financial organizations, a lot of insurance companies around the world. So, you know, we there are a lot of checks that we obviously need to go through, and a lot of things like that. Um, the for if you want to go full SAST, of course, we have kind of like all the privacy uh, statements and things like that that we require in order to in order to do that. A couple of things just to mention: uh, we don't actually look at your code. Uh, for for certain things like you know SCA for example, the code won't actually tell us what your production environment, what, sorry, what your dependency graph is going to look like. It's all about the uh, the package JSONs and things like that. So it's not your source code; it's more the uh, artifacts that you create. So things that are sent across are more about the dependency graph. Um, if you have sensitive code, um, which you know, despite what customer what um, vendors are going to say about privacy and, and and all those typical security kind of um, statements there are a couple of things that you can do you can either run full on prem in which case you know that's that's completely air gapped you won't even reach out to to sneak and that's all everything running including the vulnerability database locally on your on your servers the other thing that you can do is run with a broker and that's an open source piece of software so you can actually see uh, what goes uh, what goes across to us, and you can decide to have an, an allows or a denies list on the type of files that you want to send us, uh, and what gets what gets uh, sent across there. And I just saw it actually. I can follow All up right. on that one uh, as well from Luca, which is uh, will that require additional licensing? Uh, the on on prem isn't a free uh, tier. On prem is a paid uh, service, um, so that is something. Um, that is, uh, you know, a paid offering, and the only thing that you'll really need to do at that stage is just to make sure that the vulnerability database, which we update daily, uh, you'll get those kind of um, uh, updates, you know, applied to your local system, uh, so that uh, so that you know you're not you're not days out of your or in terms of your uh, uh, accuracy on the on the vulnerabilities. Awesome, awesome. All right, great. Well, uh, let's see if we get any more questions. And uh, just uh, just as a follow up, Chris did say uh, when you answered his question about the uh, the local, he said so we could run Sneak on the open source apps we use as our dependencies and on our local code. That's great. Thumbs and, up. So and, awesome. And in fact, in fact, on that one, uh, who's that? That was Chris, was it? It was Chris. Yep. Chris, on that, Chris, uh, for open source projects, we always have done and we always will do. Uh, offer sneak for free with unlimited tests as well. So we want to we want to make sure we do support the open source uh, open source uh, communities. So we offer sneak uh, unlimited tests for free there as well. Wow, that's great. That's super. All right, guys. Um... I'm going to leave the question and answer um, chat uh, open for a little bit longer because we still have about four minutes or so before we need to really get things uh, wrapped up uh, for question and answer. But but while we're waiting to see if we get any more questions, and uh, I did mention that today's event is being recorded, we are going to be sending out an email after today's event that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And the webinar is also going to be living on the Security Boulevard website as well. Um, um, so you can always go look for it there if for some reason you don't get that email. You just go to securityboulevard.com slash webinars and look in the on-demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. All right, guys. I, yeah, Simon, I think you've pretty much blown everybody away <laughs> with this technology and your and your uh, your demo. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I, like I said, I'm going to continue to keep this open. And uh, we'll just kind of keep chatting a little bit to see if we get any more uh, questions in. And if we don't, then uh, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, get
give uh, folks uh, maybe five minutes back in their day. So or, or if people, we'll see. If people want, we can do a quick six minute hack as well. It's uh, let, let us know yeah. in the chat if that's what you want. And we can, we can, we can perhaps do a, another quick hack, maybe a cross site scripting one or something like that. Let me maybe, know. Maybe like, maybe like a four minute hack because four I, minute I, hack. I, we could do I, it in four minutes. A few minutes to do my housekeeping at the end and, and do the drawing. For the because people get mad if they don't get their gift card drawing. That's so true. that's true. Let's do a quick, <laughs> let's do a quick four minute hack. Do your let's thing. Do, let's way. do a quick four minute hack. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do a cross site scripting uh, attack on here. And this is the idea of a cross site scripting is where I as an attacker can run a script on here. Um, now, what I'm going to do is how would you as a as a as an attacker? How would you write a you know create a script on here? Um, well. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. There's a slight delay with the chat here, and I know I'm under time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess what your answers are gonna be. The first thing I would try as an attacker is why don't we just do a script like this, and let's do an alert in here of one. Okay, let's try something like that. Exactly. There we go, Matthew. See, there's a slight delay, and I, I predicted what Matthew was gonna say there. So we try that. Okay, there's some, there's some, um, there's some sanitization. Okay, so let's try something slightly different. Um, now there was someone mentioned the idea of actually uh, creating a, a, a link to an image here. In fact, we're just going to do a link here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a bad link, okay? And on my whoops, on my bad link, uh, at this point I can just type in a URL. So I can, in fact, there we go. Chris, uh, embed an image tag but use a script instead of the image. Perfect. Um, so let's do a script instead of an image. So let's do a Java script. And here I'm going to do an alert. Oops, my typing's off today. Sorry, I'm going to perform uh, just a just a pop up of one. I'm going to try that, and it doesn't work because this is actually the marked library, and marked is making sure that um, we don't try and do naughty things. So Connor, yeah, we could do a we could do a a, a, a pling or a, um, a bang uh, exclamation mark exclamation point exclamation yeah. mark. That's it. <laughs> that, would, <laughs> that would make it an image. Uh, this just makes it a link. So we're all we're, we should be good with both. Um, now the thing it's doing is it's it's recognizing this colon here, and it's also recognizing these uh, brackets. These these are bad things that um, that the marked library that we're using here doesn't like. So I'm going to encode them. Uh, with I think it's 58, uh, 40, and 41. Okay, I'll save all that. Is that going to work? No, it doesn't. It doesn't work at all. So what do we need to do? Well, the trick here, the hack here, is actually to type in this just there, because the marked library is recognizing that as a colon. But if I remove that semicolon that is no longer a colon um but the browser recognizes that this is almost a colon and it's actually the browser it passes sanitization but it's actually the browser that turns that into a nasty link so this is actually not a semicolon that's in this link but the browser represents it as one and as a result we perform that hack um and at this stage i can grab the session grab the cookie data grab Whatever I want, and start and start, you know, impersonating people and a whole bunch of stuff like that. So there was there was the four minute hack. I hope I wasn't over time. Nope, nope, you're great. But now I'm terrible. <laughs> so thank you very much. I appreciate that. No <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, yeah, D Simon, uh, you're awesome. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Uh, lots and lots of really great stuff, and and like I said, slightly terrifying as well. So <laughs> I I do appreciate that, and I won't sleep tonight. So okay, guys. Uh, just a, a quick, uh, again, final reminder, today's event's being recorded. You'll get the email. If you don't get the email, check securityboulevard.com uh, slash webinars slash uh, on demand, and you'll find today's session right there. Real quick, let's do the, um, let's do the drawing for the four $25 Amazon gift cards. If I can get to that information. Okay, let's see. Today's winners are, Stephen L, congratulations, Stephen. Uh, Doug F, congratulations, Doug. Bill M, congratulations, Bill. And Robert B, congratulations, Robert. Uh, you guys will will be checking, uh, we'll be sending you an email via, yeah, we will be sending you an email that contains uh, all the information for your Amazon gift cards. So please check your inbox. And if you don't see anything in your inbox, please check your spam folder. 
Simon, again, thank you. What a great presentation. Uh, I have a feeling I'm going to uh, be watching this one again on demand myself because I had such a good time watching it the first time around. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. I hope you come back and do this again. I, sure, I really absolutely. do. I think it's a great one. So absolutely. Thank and, you uh, very much. Thank you very yeah. much for inviting me. And also a big thank you to everyone on the chat who participated. It was uh, excellent uh, chatting with you as well. I was going to say, what a great interactive webinar all the way around, including uh, the attendees. So yeah, thanks thanks for being a part of it as well, guys. We really do appreciate it. Uh, and uh, you know, thanks for joining us today. Well, what a great webinar all the way around. Uh, but uh, I have to sign off now. So uh, as always, uh, this is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I am signing off. Have a great day, everybody. And please, whatever you do, stay safe.